breathtaking speed, incredible agility, unbridled power. The fighter jet is an aggressive war machine. These aircraft are designed to impress. Everything is so sleek on the jet and smooth. Your first impression is, is that it's like a sports car. But 70 years of evolution has been no easy ride. From hunter to hunted. Frankly, there isn't a lot that the jet engine designer can do. It's almost no escape. To virtual invincibility. There's no doubt in pure performance terms, it probably outperforms almost everything in the sky. The ultimate fighter jet is becoming a reality. This is the most advanced fighter jet in the world. No other fighter in service can match it. Its name is Eurofighter Typhoon. Typhoon is a true 21st century aeroplane. The sense of power and um, uh, dominance, if you like, is, uh, is incredible. It's nice to be able to fly an aeroplane with uh, superb performance. Nought to Mach 1 in just 30 seconds. It impresses you upon walking up to it as being um, aggressive, purposeful. Typhoon is the result of more than 20 years of development. The evolution of the fighter jet is now nearing perfection. Typhoon's two jet engines are capable of delivering over 40,000 pounds of thrust. That's the equivalent power output of over 100 Formula One racing cars. The modern fighter jet routinely exceeds the speed of sound, yet 660 miles per hour is barely breaking sweat for Typhoon. But it's taken the jet engine decades to reach this level of performance. The jet engine was a brilliant British invention of the 1930s. It was much simpler and crucially more power efficient than the piston engine. As war approached, and Germany were locked in a desperate race to produce the first jet fighter. Then came the moment of truth, the test pilot's first flight. My first flight in a jet aircraft was a revelation to me. The main difference that was obvious to the pilot was the wonderful view ahead one had because there was no piston engine and propeller ahead of you. But it was not until the latter stages of World War II that fighters with jet engines actually went into combat. In 1944, amid great secrecy, the British unleashed their first jet fighter, the Gloucester Meteor. Uh, the outside world uh, did not know this uh, aircraft existed at all. Secret, yes, but one with a serious flaw. Really, you could run as fast down the runway as this aircraft went. It was very poor on acceleration. Uh, the problem was that the power was not immediately available in a jet engine, whereas in a piston engine you could open up the throttle very quickly and get the power on. In the early jet engines you had to open up the throttles very slowly, otherwise you would overfuel it and you're likely to put the engine out. But within just a few years the Meteor's engines had been transformed. The power had been dramatically improved and a new sleeker engine housing had cut down the drag. Speed was the new creed. And this is what 600 miles an hour looks like from the pilot's cockpit. In the early years of aviation development, speed was the defining um, advantage. Certainly in air-to-air in -air combat, the aircraft that was faster could always get away even if he couldn't outmaneuver the other aircraft. As the Cold War got chillier in the 1950s, the search for greater speed became relentless. But fast jet fighters need long runways. And runways are vulnerable to bombing. Where were the runways going to be when the Warsaw Pact attacked us? You know, in the Third World War. Aircraft designers began exploring ways of eliminating the need for a runway altogether. Vertical takeoff was the goal. But was this asking too much of the jet engine? Traditional 1950s fighter aircraft, the thrust is less than the weight of the aircraft. So they, even if you put them on their tail and pointed them straight up at the sky, they couldn't take off vertically. But the problem was not simply about producing enough thrust. 
What was needed was a massive leap of imagination in engine design. In 1961, British aeronautical engineers made that leap. What just a few years earlier had seemed impossible was now a reality. The Harrier jump jet. Here was an engine and an aircraft ready for the outbreak of World War III. Well, Harrier is unique in the sense that it can vector its thrust. That means that it can change the um, direction of the thrust of the engine. It can swivel it from uh, behind the aeroplane like any normal aircraft, but it can swivel the thrust all the way down to the vertical. Vertical takeoff relies on some ingenious equipment. The Harrier's got four nozzles, uh, two at the front, two at the back, uh, and what it means is as they rotate into the vertical, the aircraft's balancing on four columns of thrust. As you can see, it moves down, and that can go all the way down to the vertical. And all this power is produced by just one engine. Well, the Harrier is a single engine aeroplane, uh, which means a lot of demands are placed on that one engine. It's got to lift 15,000 pounds of aeroplane and weapons in addition, so it needs um, to suck an awful lot of air into the front here to operate this very large uh, single engine. When a Harrier's engine is it's possible to appreciate just how big and powerful it is. The Harrier, when it first flew in 1961, had an engine that was only producing about 11,000 pounds of thrust. The engine that's used in the Harrier today isn't very much bigger in diameter, but the thrust has gone up by a factor of two. So fighter jets were getting a lot more engine power. But these great improvements in thrust provoked a rethink in the design of anti-aircraft weapons. The focus switched to the heat all that power was now producing. One of the features of the, the jet engine is the hot exhaust plume. When a jet engine is running, it's possible to make out the heat haze generated by the thrust. View that same engine through a thermal imaging camera and the extreme heat becomes apparent. The temperature of the white areas is 1200 degrees Celsius. Technology started to become available to target that hot exhaust plume. That technology was the heat-seeking missile. First tested in 1953, by the late 1960s they were starting to take their toll on the fighter jet. In the Vietnam era, surface-to-air missiles with heat seekers on them became a major threat for low-flying jet aircraft. Infrared heat-seeking missiles simply lock on to the heat sources that you get around an aircraft, usually uh, at the rear of the aircraft around the jet engine and the jet engine plume. Once a heat-seeking missile has locked onto the jet engine, it's very difficult for the aircraft to avoid getting hit. Frankly, there isn't a lot that the jet engine designer can do or the airframe designer can do. It's almost no escape. Almost, but not quite. Aircraft have tried to counter this threat by using infrared decoy flares. What we're doing with an infrared decoy flare is to present to a missile within its field of view an alternative uh, infrared source that it sees as the better target and is seduced away from the aircraft. In a quiet corner of Wiltshire, decoy flares are remorselessly tested. They have to ignite instantaneously, and they have to work at high speed. Fire! If the aircraft is attacked, the pilot only has a split second to deploy his flares. Three, two, one, fire! Timing is crucial, reliability essential. But now there's a new approach to dealing with this threat. Don't attract the missile in the first place. By focusing on the engine exhaust, scientists at Cranfield University are searching for a way to cool the heat emitted from a jet engine. We're going to change the design of the nozzle, put on some alternative designs which are um, intended to increase the mixing of the 